Listen, I'm getting my butt implants in one hour. And therefore, I had only one hour to defeat every boss in the game. So I had to do it, guys. I had to do it. I had to take the forbidden build out of my closet and finally show it to you. Hey, I didn't want to do it yet. Not yet. It was meant to be released for when the apocalypse hit us all. But the time demands it. It is time to show a build so oppressive and powerful that this video needs a viewer discussion is advised disclaimer. Meet the Shadow Hunter. The Shadow Hunter has the ability to clone himself, and with that uses his clones to aid him in battle at any time and at any point. The Shadow Hunter only needs to point at the target that needs to die, and whatever is pointed at dies pretty much instantly. These clones are death machines. The sheer force of which they attack their target with is absolutely unrivaled. Historically, it is known that the Shadow Hunter has conquered castles, cities, and even entire regions all by himself. Well, technically, the Shadow Hunter is never truly alone when he has an entire army of clones, obviously. The Shadow Hunter is also the king of the underworld. This is the place where he houses all his clones and gathers information and prepares for his next hunt or fight. The clones follow their master in every step of the way and when he needs one or more, they can face from one plane of existence to another to help their master out in battle. What the Shadow Hunter really does however is hunt those down that have a shady history. To restore balance in the world to such a degree with his clones, nothing can or will ever escape his brutality. After defeating Melania in such an easy way, imagine that you are rewarded with a new phone and now want to play a great mobile game. What's the first game that comes to mind? Yes, Raid Shadow Legends, with many many champions bringing you a lot of variety and fun battles and challenges. Thanks to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring today's video. This game has been out for years now and I remember using Kale the first time I downloaded the game, which is like a dark elf mage type of character and I used him as my first champion to explore dungeons and kill bosses easily. And of course I got a bunch of juicy loot with him. Now this is not just a random raid sponsorship no it is raids fourth anniversary so that means dedicated offers free gifts promo codes events and a brand new fusion event where you guys can get your hands on an anniversary themed legendary champion you will also be able to take a trip down memory lane with a recap video of your stats in raid i actually do wonder how many champions i pulled last year oh and for amazon prime members who just got gambo keep an eye out for the next drop with some powerful savage gear it is available from march 2nd until march 30th with all this exciting stuff it really is now the best time to start playing therefore for new players you can get insane bonuses if you use my link in the description or scan my qr code on screen we're talking an epic champion kellen the shrike and all this stuff and then for new and existing players make sure to enter promo code four years raid to get your hands on four legendary skill tomes plus other useful stuff enjoy all your gifts and let's continue with the video so there is a very badass ability in the game that revolves around clones of you or phantoms that you can use to attack your target with. This is the Phantom Slash Ash of War and it's an extremely powerful Ash of War when used well. It is one of my favorites and I always wanted to put some shine on this Ash of War as it's incredibly underrated for how insanely powerful it is in the correct setup. So what makes it so powerful are basically a few different things. The thing with Phantom Slash is that the Phantom that you send out with it to attack your target can in fact benefit from anything you put on your own weapon. So let's say we apply Black Flame Blade on it and only attack our target with our clone, then that means that the target will in fact also receive the Black Flame damage over time debuff when my clone attacks it. This also works with the Blood Flame Blade and can for example so our clone can actually proc bleed on the enemy as well while we're just chilling in the distance i think you get the point basically any buff that we apply to our own weapon the clone and his phantom weapon will also benefit from and this is something we can really abuse because phantom slash basically gives you this ability to do a four hit combo that goes off very fast when you activate it a phantom will dash forward attacking your target followed up by you attacking the target in a similar way. Then you can press the cast button for Ash of War once again to immediately follow up with this downward strike that both the clone and you will attack your target with. But that is not all, because the 4 hit combo in itself is chainable and you can follow up the follow up with a new phantom slash. So that means you can have an infinite chain of phantom slashes. 
But wait, but wait, we have to calm down. I hear you thinking. Do we not run out of resources? Well, just look at my FP and stamina bar in any fight in this video. The Ash of War is insanely efficient. Look how tiny my FP bar is. I need a microscope to even see that thing. I spent like two points in might and I'm doing this type of damage. Yes. So long story short, these are all the reasons why Phantom Slash is so good. Basically, it boils down to insane DPS in an extremely efficient manner. Logically, the next question is then, to get the best results with Phantom Slash, which weapons should we put it on? In my opinion, there are a few options. For strength, it basically boils down to either a heavy Gargoyle Halberd or a heavy Night Raider's Glaive, while for a dexterity setup, it's going to be a Keen Guardian Sword Spear, which is the highest scaling dex weapon in the game. And then a fourth option that is very good as well is the Gravesight. The Gravesight has less AR than the other three mentioned options, but it has innate bleed and gets very respectable AR when upgraded. If you want to know more about this weapon, then and definitely check out my Grim Reaper build. But for Phantom Slash and thus in my Shadow Hunter setup, I actually prefer higher AR. Because while Innate Bleed is nice, it is not needed in this case. We will proc bleed so fast anyways as you will see in a second. Ultimately, I like the Night Raider's Glaive with a heavy infusion the most. Thematically, it fits the best, obviously. Phantom Slash is dropped by a Night Raider and it's also the weapon that the Phantom actually uses the Keen Observance among us might say, but the Gargoyle's Halberd has 5 AR more. Yes, that is true, but the Knight's Rider's Glaive has much larger range. It has approximately 1.5 times the range of the Gargoyle's Halberd. So I'll gladly sacrifice that 5 AR for that sick increase in range. Then finally, Dexterity or Strength. Well, being a strength scaling weapon means we can two-hand it and thus get that 1.5 times multiplier bonus to our AR as well. Which is nice for those that want to level beyond level 125, as it will in fact make it so that the Night Raider's Glaive becomes the best mix between best range, best AR and highest potential. Now my Shadow Hunter consists out of two aspects, one with Blood Flame Blade and one with Black Flame Blade. Both are very good and the best thing is, is that you can in fact use them both in my setup in the most optimized way as well. Like I said, every single hit, whether it's you or your clone, while using Phantom Slash will apply the debuff of these incantations on your targets. So that is a bunch of percentage based extra damage or a bunch of extra bloodlust buildup and some fire damage up for every hit of the Phantom Slash chain. Generally you want to use Black Flame Blade versus Bleed Immune Enemies and then Blood Flame Blade versus Enemies where you can actually proc bleed. So the best way to play the build will be to use the both of them depending on the situation. But if you have a certain favoritism for one of the two then that's also absolutely fine and you'll see why in this video as well. First we're starting off with the Blood Flame Blade variation however because the vast majority of the bosses in the game are in fact not immune to bleed. When you optimize the build around it, and I'll show you the setup in a second, this is what you get. Complete domination. You can erase the existence of any boss in the game from 100 to 0 in pretty much one go. Basically just one shot bosses and do insane damage. And you already see that these numbers are absolutely insane. But like always, I will also show off this build on all relevant bosses and bosses that are just generally considered to be difficult. So you can actually see that my build works on everything and not just one or two bosses. So let's go ahead and immediately start off fighting the universally agreed upon hardest boss in the game. Melania. We can literally just one shot Melania with this build like it's absolutely nothing. The reason why it works so incredibly well is because we can really capitalize on the speed of how this Ash of War takes off so the damage ramps up very quickly. But the thing with how the Shadow Hunter is built is that he's also very tanky so he can easily trade hits and just keep going with the flow and keep attacking. But I've also obviously optimized for its damage output, which is why we're just completely decimating Melania. In the case of Melania, she's also a humanoid type of enemy and thus also gets staggered by her hits, which means we additionally also crowd control her consistently, making us not only very oppressive, but we just completely control the flow of the fight, as you see. And would you just look at that damage yet again? And the best thing is, it doesn't rely on like using 8 million buffs to achieve these numbers. No, it is just the actual power of the build itself and the idea behind the Shadow Hunter. And I hear you thinking, what about Melania Phase 2? I'm glad you asked. Let's take a look at that. 
When she jumps up, you can use that moment to replenish yourself. Move across the room, get your HP back to normal, rebuff your weapon, do whatever you need while she recovers. Then it's time to go Shadow Hunter mode part 2. Hunt down Melania like the rodent she is, completely destroy her to the point that she becomes beyond recognition and you can actually negate her waterfall dance as well because the speed of which she built up bloodlust over time thanks to bloodflame blade and proc bleed while she's doing the waterfall dance means you can just cancel her dance. The damage output ultimately that you get is yet again absolutely cuckoo while simultaneously bullying Melania to such a degree that you negate her mechanics like it's absolutely nothing. 20k damage in phase 1 in one go and over 16k damage in phase 2 in one go as well. If that is not OP then what is? Okay, so there are obviously a lot more bosses in the game than just Melania and you might ask what about this boss or this annoying boss? Well, let's go ahead and showcase the build on all other bosses as well. To make things a bit more interesting, however, and to really prove the OPness of this build, I will introduce some additional rules for fighting the other bosses. Rule number one, play the build as dumb as possible. So, for instance, use Phantom Slash when I see that it in some way will not be beneficial for me to use it in that way, but I'm craving that damage, and as a result, tunnel wishing so much that I will still use it in that way. And then rule number two, and this one goes hand in hand with rule number one, actually. Spam Phantom Slash as much as possible like a NPC that is programmed badly. A bit like the mages at Raya Lucaria, which are like the most annoying mobs in the game. Does that sound good? Nice, cool. Make sure to subscribe by the way if you haven't yet, because there are a lot of you out there who watch my videos regularly but still have not pressed that button. So it is time to do so. Hit the bell as well and give the video a like. Thank you, you are my BFF now, that helps out a lot. Let's get right into the boss fights. Fire Giant is easy peasy, he's way too slow and big to handle the Shadow Hunter. It is a really easy fight. Next up, the Godskin duo. Right from the get-go, we can erase the existence of the bigger individual, and the rest of the fight is history, really. Also, make sure to keep spamming the Ash of War, even if the individual Godskin fighter is already dead, because it will still keep dealing damage to them after the Godskin dies. The only nuisance in this fight wasn't the actual fight. It was when I killed both of them and had to wait like an hour before another one respawned to finish off the fight. Killing the Godskin duo like this is also extremely satisfying. The malformed rider that is on the path between the duo and Malekit can be taken down instantly as well. It doesn't even matter if you die in the process of decimating this guy. Literally, you're so oppressive, you will still kill whatever you're fighting, even if you die. That's the power level right here, even if you die, you still win. The Beast Clergyman fight went on so fast that I missed it in real time unfortunately because I blinked and that's probably the only negative with this build. You cannot blink guys, so get a pair of clothes pins to open up your eyes permanently to make sure you never miss out on your own fights. Malekith, same story really, get an opening and the status of this boss fight is relegated to the point as if you're fighting another random mob in the open world. Up next we have the one and only Gideon. This fight is a perfect illustration of of how amazing the tracking is with this Ash of War. Your enemies cannot escape you, making you the ultimate hunter. Wherever they go, you and your clone go. And that's exactly why this very well might be the most oppressive build of all time. And again, another free easy win. Then we have the first Elden Lord. Godfrey. We all know this guy packs a punch and has a censored word of health. But the Shadow Hunter doesn't care. You can have 1 million HP or 69 HP. You just do not have a chance. When Horalu shows up, however, 
it's the same story but even easier really these fights also illustrate very well that your clone comes out so fast the spam with this ash of war gets really nuts the clone can even reach places that you usually can't reach because the clone can in fact fly and dish out damage in otherwise unreachable spots and because the clone comes out even when you get hit it's basically just an unstoppable train of damage on your opponents now for fights like Radican, which is immune versus bleed, I use the Black Flame Blade buff instead. So the setup that I've already provides me a lot of raw AR, which means that the build is completely independent of bleed. It's just an extra essentially to make the fights even shorter. And as you can see versus Radican, the damage gets absolutely bonkers as well with Black Flame Blade and you can kill him quickly as well. Now the only bad thing about the Black Flame Blade buff is that it only lasts 7 seconds. So you have to keep reapplying it to get the full benefit from it. And in that sense, Blood Flame Blade is just a better incantation. But in just 7 seconds, you can do in fact a lot. As you see here in this fight versus late game Loretta. So as you can see, I use the buff on my weapon right here. And immediately I start my way to the boss with Phantom Slash. And trust me, in 7 seconds with this build, you can do a lot. Even if you forgot to reapply the buff or just don't want to bother with it, with the raw AR in this build you will still completely destroy. But it's however visually quite easy to see if your weapon still has the buff or not. When the black flame particles disappear around the weapon you can just move away from the boss, maybe even replenish your HP and FP and then use black flame blade again and finish off the fight. Now like I mentioned already, the actual buff of Black Flame Blade basically boils down to you dealing a percentage based damage on your targets that ramps up over 2 seconds. So that means that it's even better versus targets with a lot of HP as the percentage of damage is in fact based on the target's full HP. So versus the Elden Beast it is pretty much a gift from above. Just make sure to use it when he's open essentially as he does fly over the area all of the time. So in this fight you can't obviously just spam the Ash of War when he moves away. But when he lands or stays in one spot, you can absolutely decimate him as well as always. And the damage gets really crazy with your amazing raw damage output and then Black Flame Blade in addition and just the speed of Phantom Slash. Now I finished the game at level 125, the lowest meta level with these stats. This is also an incredibly stat efficient build. You can do it with very low levels as you see. So the stats that you want to follow are pretty linear. 80 strength to fully soft cap on it, a decent amount of vigor and endurance for tankiness and sustain and we need this amount of endurance to wield the shadow hunter's armor while staying in the medium load category. I only spent a few points in mind due to how insanely efficient the ash of war is and then finally 17 fate to cast both blood flame blade as well as black flame blade with 17 fate we can also cast flame grant me strength which boosts our damage output even more. If you want to go for a level 150 setup definitely get 60 vigor. Fully soft cap on it to trade even better and just get 10 more strength even though it's past the soft cap. With the two handed bonus that we get it's still nice to have. The best starting class for this build is going to be the hero due to the heavy investment in strength but also relatively speaking stats like enders and vigor. You can obtain phantom slash right after you defeat Morgoth in the passage beyond the grand lift of Rold by defeating the knight rider when it's night in game time and you can get the knight's rider's glaive in Lyurnia between the Belem church and the east raya lucaria gate when yet again is night in game and you have to defeat another knight rider for that as well. This means that this is a mid and late game and ng plus build and now that we know that there is dlc coming this is going to be an insanely powerful option for completely decimating the dlc as well so make sure to save and bookmark this video for when the dlc launches if you need a build that transitions into this build because you're starting a new playthrough altogether i'll put some get op early options for the hero or just pure strength in general in the description so check that out the rest of our setup looks like this for talismans you definitely need the rotten winged sword insignia or the 
normal Winged Sword Insignia, as you see with how fast we hit our enemies, we unlock the final tier of this talisman really quickly, and thus get that maximum bonus to our damage output quickly as well. Shard of Alexander is self-explanatory, more damage to our Ash of War is incredibly good than the Lord of Blood's Exaltation Talisman, because we proc bleed really fast, so another very significant damage boost for free essentially. For fights where you use Black Flame Blade, however, instead of Blood Flame Blade, I would swap out the Lord of Blood's Exaltation Talisman with the old lord talisman so we can make the duration of black flame blade last a bit longer and then finally absolutely mandatory is the dragon crest great shield talisman it is our defensive talisman and will make us be able to take a lot of hits while we're shredding our enemies it is very important for trading hits very efficiently if you haven't gotten it yet then use any of the lesser greater shield talisman variations until you get this beast talisman ultimately these four talismans in combination is what i found to be the most optimal for the flask we run the thorny crack tier for exactly the same reason as our rotten winged sword insignia talisman and i use the fate mold crystal tier to get 10 levels in fate extra for free which means we can use golden vow in addition as well this is a very nice incantation because it gives us both offensive and defensive stats and there's nothing else really worth putting in the flask anyways so might as well run this crystal tier for golden vow armor there's only one set for this build possible the knight's cavalry set but make sure to use the altered version of the helm and the armor to actually completely mimic the look of the phantom that you sent out with phantom slash this will create the clone effect and thankfully this combination of armor pieces will in fact put us over that 50 poise threshold which means we can resist hits that could have potentially interrupted our phantom slash and the armor set gives us great defensive stats as well so all of that will mean we can trade even better with our enemies which can definitely not be underestimated this is not a build where you just want to ignore armor both thematically and functionally speaking just to quickly reiterate make sure to infuse your knight rider's glaive with heavy as this is a pure strength build and for the seal you can use any seal but i recommend using a seal that has zero weight now finally if you want to take it to the next level the skill ceiling of the build can get very high very quickly if you really utilize phantom slash to the next degree it isn't needed as you saw when you have the optimal load out but the thing with phantom slash however is that you can move away from your target in any direction while casting the ash of war so if you cast the ash of war and then accordingly give an input to move backwards your character will in fact dash backwards instead of towards the target. Following the same logic, if you give an input to move to the left, your character will in fact dash to the left, and this works for any direction. The reason I'm mentioning this is because you can utilize it to dodge enemies' attacks as well while you're attacking them, and this is a very unique mechanic, and it also introduces kiting, meaning you can kill things while you're moving away from them. This is also useful for not getting any damage yourself, but it also means you can defeat anything while you're on the move. And with that, you see that the build has a lot of depth to it, while being insanely powerful, making it really fun to play. And now the time has come for you to make your own Shadowhunter and destroy everything yourself.